Hello and welcome to the Irish History Podcast. My name is Finn Dwyer and this is From Cork to Bermuda and Back, An Irish Woman's Life in the British Army. Through the 18th and 19th century, large numbers of Irish men served in the British Army. However, there was also lots of Irish women whose lives were interwoven with the military. While not soldiers, they became part of the army through marriage to members of regiments stationed in Ireland. This led to unusual and captivating lives. In this episode, I interview historian Dr. Aoife Vernock about a Cork woman called Bridget Kent, who married a British army soldier. Aoife gives us great insights into the life of Bridget, who was born in Fermoy in 1859, but after her marriage to a soldier, her life changed dramatically. Aoife also gives vivid details about the incredible travels Bridget Kent engaged on, which took her from Egypt to Bermuda, but also what life was like when she returned home to an Ireland where attitudes towards the British Army were changing during the First World War and the War of Independence. While all this is ahead of us, if you want to get even more content, the Patrons Only series, which is based on chapters from my book Life in Medieval Ireland, starts again after a couple of weeks of a hiatus with a double episode this week. If you want to get that episode and support the show, check out patreon.com forward slash Irish podcast. That's patreon.com forward slash Irish podcast. You can also support the show by checking out the shop at irishhistorypodcast.ie forward slash shop. That's irishhistorypodcast.ie forward slash shop. I'm adding new items there every week, so don't forget to check back in and see what's new. So I'm joined by Dr. Aoife Verrock. Aoife, do you want to introduce yourself to listeners? So I've been working on garrison towns for about 10 years, and that's my main research interest. And I've also started a podcast recently where I've been talking about banned books. And I read the dirty books in order to find out just how dirty they are. Um, So every week I put on my sensor spectacles and try and figure out what are the rude bits in all of the books that you've heard about. Some of them are famous, some of them are not. Um, And I'm a historian of 20th century Ireland, mostly. I'm very interested in cultural and social issues. And that's why I like to concentrate either on spatial town stuff, like garrison towns, because I like to know how the streets work. And as an obsessive reader, that's why I'm reading books for a censored podcast. Great stuff. And I would really recommend people to check out Censored. Now we're going to move on to the fascinating life of a woman called Bridget Kent. And Aoife, can you explain the early years of this woman? Bridget Kent is the daughter of a publican, and she grows up over the pub in Abbey Street in Fromoy Town. And Abbey Street is on the south side of Fromoy Town, which is kind of considered like the Catholic side of the town um, because it has the Catholic church and all of the Catholic schools and religious foundations whereas the north side is dominated by two huge barracks and a number of the Protestant churches are on that side as well. So she grows up, she she grows up on what's considered the Catholic regular town side, but her town is very much dominated by the two barracks. And as the daughter of a publican, she would have been very familiar with soldiers and officers coming into the pub to drink. Um, there is a huge amount of drinking culture associated with military masculinity. And you've touched on it there, but Fermoy, I'll just say to listeners, is in it's in County Cork, but Fermoy is what's often referred to in Ireland as garrison towns. There's lots of them where I'm recording um, in Kilkenny. It certainly became a garrison town. Can you just explain a bit maybe about what was it like to grow up in a garrison town? How did these towns differ from other Irish towns that wouldn't have had big British army garrisons? Well, the funny thing is geographers don't think of Formoy as a garrison town because it wasn't founded by the military. It's a religious foundation originally, but, you know, that's very many centuries ago. So a garrison town, they really start to come to the fore from the 17th century. The very first barracks are built in 1698 and 1700. So that's Cork, Limerick and Dublin and Athlone. But then at the end of the 18th century, the British army transforms into this barracked system. So instead of soldiers living with people in a billeting system where you just live in a house as a soldier among the civilians, barracks are built to bring them all into the one place, put them behind walls and put them in big dormitories. 
So a barrack is a very particular sort of structure. And so in Ireland from the late 18th century, there are lots of these barracks built and these enormous structures, they can contain up to a thousand, two thousand men. And then you've got horses and you've got all the trades that go with it. So they really transform the economy of an area. First of all, they demand a huge amount of fodder for the horses and food for the men and drink for the men also, alcohol among them. And then the men are spending what little money they have in the town. And so every day they walk out dressed in uniform through the town. And so you, you have to imagine a city or a townscape that we can't imagine now where you would be passing men in uniform all day regularly. Um, because at that time they don't have civilian clothes. They're not allowed to wear civilian clothing until the 20th century when they're off duty. So all throughout this time period, the only clothes the soldier owns are his uniform. So he's always representing himself as a soldier. And the economy and the social life really is transformed around their interests. Um, they join clubs, they establish clubs, the officers hunt. Uh, the demand for horses in particular in a county like Cork drives the horse industry. And around Formoy, it's quite well known now for its horse industry. And officers' money to buy the horses throughout the centuries definitely had that impact. And then Bridget herself marries a soldier. Um and um, we talk a bit about him, but can you tell us maybe about Joseph and whether was this match, would it have been considered advantageous for a woman like Bridget? Joseph Dowling is not the standard soldier, actually, because he's not a labourer. The vast majority of men who join are the very poorest and those considered unskilled. His father was a stonemason, so he could have had a trade if he wanted it. But of course, not everyone wants to do the same job their father did. So maybe growing up in Kildare, surrounded as he was by soldiers from the Curra, he thought it looked like a good option. Um, and he certainly does well because he becomes a sergeant within five years of joining, which is quite quick progression. And it suggests that he was actually literate before he joined. And as the son of a tradesman, it wouldn't be surprising if he had some basic education before he joined the army. And he certainly is a good catch insofar as that, you know, you can talk like that. Um, a sergeant has better pay and better conditions than an ordinary enlisted soldier. And for Bridget, some soldiers, actually privates who've written, who wrote their autobiographies, a Scottish soldier called John Pindar wrote an autobiography about his time in Formoy. And he said that, you know, Fromoy was full of lovely ladies and, you know, that they were always given the, the red coats, the glad eye. But then he says, in every garrison town, women are really interested in sergeants and NCOs. They're not very interested in the ordinary soldier, no matter how beautiful he may be. He obviously thinks he's hot. And so he's like, well, the women are, yeah, they're interested in soldiers, but they're interested in soldiers with status, with good prospects and with good incomes. And as a soldier's wife, if you marry an NCO, you're marrying on the strength with the permission of the commanding officer, which means that you have much better conditions as, an, as a wife. You know, you get rations, you can get a place to live in the barrack. It's a much better option. So if Bridget is to choose to marry a soldier, she makes the right choice in choosing a sergeant over a private. And then after her marriage, I suppose she's become the wife of a soldier. Uh, what does that entail, initially at least, for Bridget? I, I assume her, her life is not going to change and that she leaves her family home, she moves in. But does she live in the barracks or how does that work? We don't know for sure she did live in the barracks in Formoy, for example. She may not have. She may have elected to stay in her family home for the few years that they were there before they move on with the regiment. Soldiers... Are, who were married with leave could live outside the barracks. They got permission often to live outside with their wives and children. And it really varied from regiment to regiment and also from the barracks themselves, whether they were set up for accommodation or not. Um, for example, in the Curra, almost everyone who's married lives within the camp. But in Cork City, about 40% of those who are married live outside the barrack walls. So we're not really sure whether she chose to live outside or not. It was really 
I suppose, dependent on whether the conditions in, in the barracks were good, whether they had dedicated married quarters. A lot of barracks have lovely purpose-built married quarters by about the 1880s, but the older ones don't. So in an old barracks, a married couple are living in a dormitory. So there would be six beds, for example, in a dormitory and the married couple have one and all they have is a curtain around them for privacy. Um, so that wouldn't be unusual for a lot of married women. But a sergeant and an NCO might have better quarters. So living within the barracks might only mean sharing with two other people. So it might be acceptable. We don't really know for sure if she moved in straight away. And through her marriage to Joseph, Bridget, I suppose, gets to live what's quite an unusual life at the time in that she gets to see the world when the regiment goes overseas. So can you maybe talk us through a little bit about where she goes initially, I suppose, anyway? Initially, she heads straight to England and they go to Chatham and another child is born there. We can track her progress across the globe through her births, actually, <laughs> because in the census records, you had to write down where your children were born. And her census record is amazing because it says she has nine children. Nine of them survived. And she wrote down Egypt, Malta, Bermuda, Nova Scotia, Chatham. I mean, it's extraordinary to see the list. So you can track her around the world and also follow the regiment itself, the Royal Irish Rifles. Um, so as she moves around, she gives birth in a number of these places. And it's really an achievement that she travels so extensively, probably while pregnant some of the time, and manages to have all of these children successfully. The fact that she ends up giving birth to two children in Bermuda who survive early infancy in Bermuda is something else. The conditions were often poor in barracks there and also the climate and the tropical diseases that she would have been exposed to Although by this point at the late 19th century, things are better within the army and the mortality rates aren't quite as catastrophic as they were in the 18th. It's still a dangerous business having babies anywhere, not to mind in a tropical climate when you're not actually from it. So she has a really cosmopolitan life when you look at where she travels to. And she's able to travel like that because she's an official army wife and she's on the strength. So her travel is paid for. If she had married someone without permission, she wouldn't have been able to travel like that and would have been left behind. So her journey reflects her role within the army as, I mean, she's part of the army. I know she's not officially a soldier, but she is treated almost as a soldier because she's on the strength and her children are also paid for to travel around. So the entire family migrates so Bermuda, Nova Scotia, then they come back to Egypt and then they go to Malta. And it's really incredible to see them move around so much like that. And they're part of this small, relatively small group of women and children who move around with soldiers officially like this in the 19th century. In early, earlier centuries, women and children traveled more in larger numbers. But by this point, she represents quite a small group of people, actually. And in some of these places, particularly I'm thinking just as you named them there, certainly Egypt and Bermuda, she is she becoming part of a colonial elite in those places? Uh, as I, you're, you're talking there, she is more or less part of the British Army establishment, whereas maybe in Ireland she might have viewed herself as slightly different. I suppose what I'm wondering is in places like Egypt and Bermuda, race relations are maybe more explicit. People in Ireland are obviously, um, and you can see multiple examples of racism in 19th century Ireland, but I'm guessing that it's probably more explicit, explicit in places like Egypt and Bermuda. Of course, she's, she's white and she's part of the white colonial force that maintains its control over these areas. So she is part and parcel of that system, as are her children. And they are, of course, treated as white. Within the army, the army is very interested in those national identities within the British army, English, Irish, Scottish. It writes those down on the form all the time. So it's constantly reproducing those four nation identities. Um, but certainly outside of that kind of bubble of bureaucracy, she is most definitely part of the colonial structure and would have been, had to be part of it 
um, in that sense, her interaction with the local populations have been structured around whether they were servants in the barracks, you know, how much work she had to do within a colonial system, because army wives had to do work as well. They had to wash and they had to maintain clothing and contribute to the barrack system itself. But the rules for that vary in colonial stations and they're very different to home stations. So she would have experienced very different terms of service according to the location of the barracks and the colour of the colonised people. And then she arrives back in Ireland. Can you tell us a bit maybe when she comes back? So what time period we're roughly talking about here? Um, she was born in the 1870s, so we've probably moved on 30 years, I'm guessing, or more. Um, but she comes back to Ireland. And this move gives her a certain amount of independence when she opens up a pub back in Fermoy. Um, can you talk about this? She must have been, I suppose, somewhat um, considered almost exotic moving back after this world trip. Well, she moves back to Fermoy in the 1890s um, after traveling around the world for about 20 years. She got married in 1876. Um, so she moves back to Fermoy, I think, because her husband becomes a pensioner at that point. He discharges himself from the army. But a lot of pensioners don't formally then leave the army. They stay working within the army as mess servants or uh, working within the, the regiment. And that's what Joseph Dowling did. He stayed with the regiment. And so he went to India and she took her children home to Fermoy. Now, she couldn't travel with him anymore um, on the paid account because he's a pensioner. So she loses all her rights to being part of the army establishment once he discharges himself. So they kind of go their separate ways. And I, I don't know why. It could be that her two eldest children are 17 and 15 about at this point. And at 15, the army doesn't give children rations anymore or accommodation rights. So it looks like the cost of maintaining her two older children within the army was just too much. And so they split and she goes home with her 17 down to about two year old children um, and returns to probably her family home, actually, um, because her father had died some years earlier. Her father, the publican, had died and her widowed mother was running the pub. So she probably moved back home there temporarily, at least. And her husband then continued on to India, where he died very shortly afterwards, actually. And when she's coming back, he spent a long time in the army. Would they have had any savings of any kind? Or is this she's arriving back to Fermoy, like having lived probably a very different life, but not with very much uh, money in her pocket? Funnily enough, we do know that they had gold doubloons, which they had picked up on their travels. I don't know how many of those she had at the beginning, but a few years after she came home, her one of her children uh, was tricked by some army reservists into giving them his gold doubloons, his mother's gold doubloons, which he took from her dresser without her knowledge. And they, they then sold them. Um, it was a rather sad story of like false pretenses where they were saying they were going to get them valued and they would give him the money. And it ended up in court. That's how I know about it, because it appears in the in the examiner newspaper, an account of, you know, Alfred Dowling and being tricked by these two men and how he had he gave them one Maltese and two Spanish gold doubloons. So clearly they had picked things up in the course of their travels. It's probably relatively easy to pick that sort of thing up as you move around the world in locations where it's commonly found. Um, so I suspect she did have a little nest egg when she came home. It, it certainly sounds like it. She may have converted some of that to cash um, because she then takes out a license on a public house near the old barracks. So rather than operate her mother's public house in Abbey Street, she then starts her own business. So I think she must have had something to get started with. So when she opens her own uh, pub, that must have been quite a change in her life in that in the army, she's doing things like washing or subject to some level of army discipline, I suppose, on some level or expectation, maybe is a better word. 
But this must have been quite a change in her life. She's her own boss, essentially, now. She's running a business in the town. So the opening up of the pub must have been a positive change in her life, I guess. It was a big change to be able to run her own establishment like that. I mean, she wasn't subject to army discipline because when you live within the army structure, women and children are just as much part of discipline as the men. So it must have been quite liberating for her. But of course, she opens her pub like three doors away from the gates of the main (laughs) barracks. So she's not really going far from the military culture that she's been living in for 20 years. Um, And also she does have her mother living with her at the beginning. So maybe there's a certain amount of uh, not quite in charge of one's own household if your elderly mother is there. So it's possible that, you know, she's still still very much located within the power dynamics of her own family and still very closely attached to the military. I mean, it's interesting that she doesn't run a pub in Abbey Street. She chooses to run a pub in East Barrack Lane, literally 50 metres from the gates of the barracks. And then I suppose as is common in families like hers, some of her sons go on to join the army. Um, How many of her children end up in the British Army? There is at least two boys join the army. I don't know whether any of the girls married soldiers. That was something that was very frequent. Um, The girls in a military family often married soldiers. It's just familiarity. It's like a family business. Um, In the 19th century especially, work is very familial and it's very intergenerational. So it isn't surprising that men and women would continue with the sort of work patterns that they would have seen. Um, But one of her children, Alfred, is a career soldier um, by the time World War I breaks out. So he's in his 30s. So he's not part of that, you know, conscript army. He's the professional soldier from, you know, very much like the previous generations. Um, And so he goes to war as a professional soldier, but is very quickly captured and spends the whole war in a prison, prisoner of war camp. So he doesn't have, you know, a very exciting or luckily for him lethal war because he survives um but he's more he's definitely represents that older generation of professional soldier that we don't hear a lot about from world war one you know they're not they're not part of the story much but there is a core of them at the very beginning and back in ireland this is obviously a time as well to say particularly um in the later years of the war, 1916, but then particularly 1917, 1918, around the conscription crisis, where attitudes to the British Army, I think, are definitely starting to harden and change. And certainly by 1919, uh, you've had very different view of people in the army, even though obviously huge numbers of people throughout the 19th century had served. Um, I suppose it's a more controversial career choice, for want of a better term, in Ireland in the early 20th century. Does this affect Bridget herself? Would she have been viewed differently in the town? Would she have been viewed as maybe on the other side of a barrier that's emerging in the early 20th century? Well, Formoy Town isn't particularly Republican um, in the early years of the Republican struggle, especially. Most of the activists we associate with that part of Cork County actually come from the hinterland itself rather than the town. So the town isn't very Republican, although it is sympathetic in a general sense. There is that great thing in a lot of colonized countries where people are against the government on principle, but are quite okay with a lot of the government stuff on the ground because they run it and they benefit from it and they're able to negotiate it. Um, So although people are, you know, objectively against British rule they're kind of like well it's you know the army a lot of the lads who join the army are okay you know yeah okay the British army sucks but the army people aren't necessarily bad and within Fermoy there is a reluctance I think to go over to that other side in the Sinn Féin struggle until almost the very end the urban district council doesn't transfer its allegiance until close to the very end Um, And there is a big, there's a process in a garrison town where the British army successfully alienates the local population through reprisals and through rioting and violence. And that happens in Formoy from 1919, when a party of British soldiers are attacked on their way to church by the IRA and one of them dies. 
And the next, that evening after that man's death, the soldiers are released onto the streets by their commanding officers and they, you know, they sack the town. And that's the beginning of a number of violent encounters between the soldiers and the local citizenry that starts to turn people's turn people's ideas against the soldiers. And, you know, there's obviously, if you're going to take away the pragmatic economic value of, of the barracks and the soldiers are just going to become riotous, drunken louts who beat people up, it's going to really impact on people's opinion eventually. Yeah, yeah. Um, so Formoy itself takes a long time, I think, to turn that way. Um, and people continue to serve soldiers in the pubs, and there is no suggestion of local boycotts within garrison towns against soldiers. Um, soldiers are certainly at risk when they leave barracks because of IRA activity, but there's no suggestion that the population that there's no suggestion that the population as a whole is terribly antagonistic towards them. Um, it's not something I suppose we know enough about yet. I mean, we know there's a huge amount of anti-soldier propaganda from Sinn Féin, but we don't know how that structured the daily relationships as people are walking down the street. Did, did people give them the cold shoulder? Did they cross the road? Did they spit at them as they walk by? We just don't know, and it, it doesn't appear in the papers. So I, I can't be sure how it affected Bridget as the mother of, of a British soldier. So she actually moved to England. Or she subsequently left Ireland and went to live with her one of her children. But the Dowling pub continues to be run by members of the Dowling family after her. So it, it is passed down. It's more about retirement yeah. on her part rather than some people who do leave Ireland in the years after independence because for one degree or another they had been tied into an, a British administration but this is not what's going on with her it's more that traditional early 20th century retirement where you live with one of your um live with one of your children i i think she retires to go live with some of one of her sons that's it's really just you know going to move in with with one of the boys um so she leaves the business and it continues to be run as Dowling's pub it's no longer there now, actually. Uh, the building itself was gone and everything. There was a lot of demolition on that particular lane. Um, and that lane is now is sort of renamed as well because in the, in the 1920s, Formoy politicians decided to rebrand Formoy. And so they got rid of a lot of the imperial and uh, military associations in the street names. So West Barrack Lane and East Barrack Lane became Bridget Street. Uh, Barrack Hill was renamed Oliver Plunkett Hill, although apparently that one didn't take. Locals still refer to refer to it as Barrack Hill. Um, you know, Bank Street became Kent Street, for example. There was a lot of rebranding that went on, you know, to sort of cover up that historical legacy. But it isn't unusual at this independence period. There's a lot of renaming and there's a lot of, you know, assertion of control of the landscape in a lot of towns and cities. Um, so Formoy isn't particularly unusual in that. It's just that it, it happens all at once in Formoy as well. They do it very, very quickly. And then just to wrap up, do you want to tell listeners about your own podcast? So my own podcast isn't actually about this sort of history. It's about a different kind of history. I'm more interested in reading the banned books. Um, the Irish Censor is notorious for banning thousands of books and we know the, of the famous ones. We all know that Ulysses was suppressed. We've heard of Edna O'Brien's entanglements with the censors. But what about all the other books? There are th thousands of books were banned. And I want to know why precisely they were banned. The censor didn't have to leave a reason, but I'd like to guess. So I'm reading like a censor and seeing if I can find the rude bits. And uh, I actually read the rude bits out as well, which is the best part. So the idea is that I take a book a week and I read a book and tell you whether you should also read it because some of them are trash and some of them are hot trash. And I think it's an important <laughs> distinction. You can find Aoife's podcast Censored wherever you listen to podcasts. And I'd like to take this opportunity to thank Aoife for her time 
Now, don't forget, if you want to get even more Irish history content before next week's episode, you can get the exclusive patrons-only shows at patreon.com forward slash irishpodcast. Until next time, Sloan. Thank you.